There we go. Okay, everybody. <laughs> this is uh, Sandy Simmons bringing you uh, the Silver Tent and talking tonight about fasting and uh, therapeutic fasting and intermittent fasting and anything in between. So what I wanted to do was just do a brief introduction um, so that it gives a couple of minutes for people to, to join in if they're a little bit late. Just a little bit about fasting. So just excuse me if I'm looking down because I do have to read a few notes. So fasting provides uh, several health benefits, as we probably all know who are on the call here. So it includes weight loss, blood sugar control, and protection against medical conditions like cancer and neurodegenerative neuro diseases. So despite its recent surge in popularity, fasting is a practice that dates back centuries and plays a central role in many cultures and religions in various formats. And uh, really, it's all about, um, you know, giving the digestive system a rest and uh, allowing our bodies to do a bit of regeneration. So that's the basics of fasting, really. So fasting causes your body to begin multiple cellular repair processes, which are beneficial for not only your body, but your mind. This includes the removal of waste material from cells and protecting against immune system damage. There's a word that's bandied around a little bit, which I just thought I'd explain what that is in case anyone's heard of it, but they're not quite sure what it is. And it's autophagy, and I hope I've said that right because I'm down here in Australia, we might pronounce it different. But um, so you may or may not have heard it or come across it, but it simply means the destruction of damaged or redundant cellular components occurring in the vacuoles within the cell. Now, vacuoles um, are the components of the cell that collect and remove waste. So basically, it's, it's just autophagy is just saying this is what fasting does. Okay, it helps to remove waste. So I have a little caution here, just if um just to start off with. And if anyone doesn't follow a particular fasting program or is being supported, there is always the propensity to go too far and cause damage rather than enhancing your organs in the body. That's just a little caution that I, I give people because. I've had to rescue quite a number of people, but I'm talking about long fasting of water fasting or people have just gone off on their own tangent and the, it's the first time they've done it and they're just, oh, I feel so good, I'll just keep doing it. <laughs> so, it, you know, you, there's, always, um, there's always a caution there to be really mindful and to make sure that you've researched well or, or that you have someone supporting you. So... Without any further to do, I'm going to go around to our lovely panel who've joined us tonight and uh, get them to introduce themselves, say where they're from and why they joined the panel tonight. So I'm going to go over to Patricia first. Hi, um, yes, I'm Patricia Cherry, um, for, uh, informally known as Trish. Um, I've been fasting um, intermittently now for about 18 months. Um, I started out uh, not really understanding what clean fasting meant until I came across a woman called Jean Stevens who wrote a book called um, Deny, Delay Don't Deny and another book called Fast Feast Repeat. And she pointed out how important it is to clean fast um since then clean fasting by the way is no nothing that even resembles food even in, even with taste ever since then which was october last year um i've got gone great guns and i i love fasting i, I don't get hungry um and if i do i remember that it's only for a few minutes it'll soon pass um but i don't go for long long fast uh my fasting protocol is around anything from 16.8 to 24. I'm sure that'll be explained as we go on. It will. So thank you, Patricia. Uh, let's go over to Katie. 
<clears throat> Hello there. Um, I'm Katie. I'm, I live in the south of England, actually, and I've been interested in all things sort of natural health for over 30 years. And I basically experiment on myself, really, um, before trying anything else. And I, I've done various types of fasting. I've tried sort of um, mono diet type things where, you know, I think the first time I, I thought oh, I can't possibly do just water. So I tried with um, so just a single fruit for a few days, but I was so bored after three days, I swapped it for another one for the following two days. Um, but that was really effective in terms of sort of cleansing effect on my intestines. Um, I've also done sort of raw food uh, so more, not a fast specifically, but um, challenge myself to eat in certain ways. Um, and more recently done more with just three to five day water fasts, actually. Um, and I'm really interested because I know that um, some people with clean fasting, I think it may be where you, you can have black coffee and things like that. And I've always avoided using other things I've just done it with the water so I'm really interested to find out um, what other people's experience is of it and how that can benefit because I've certainly experienced the benefits and you know really especially I think with um, reducing cravings and stabilizing blood sugar I found really good for that. Excellent thank you Katie and Christine. Oh Hello, um, I'm Christine Miller. Uh, I'm currently in the southwest of France. Um, and fasting has been something I have done for years, and many, many years, uh, in different forms of, of calorie reduced diets. Um, and I remember when a diet called the Cambridge diet was introduced, which was a long time ago in the 1980s, when an American friend said to me, this is the nearest thing um, to fasting, but you're still getting adequate nutrition. Um, I, I wasn't too sure about that. I did work with it for some time, but I, I I had a feeling that it was messing with my metabolism and uh, move, moved on to a, a, a different uh, way, way of eating, basically. And everything went, was, was going fine. Um, and that's how I, I spent most of, my, most of my life up, up until 2016, which was a year after we moved here. And I, I fell over on some steps and I damaged the back of um, my leg, my right leg, and it would not heal. It was, I've still actually got a scar from how bad the, what turned into a leg ulcer became. And um, I was being given all multiple different types of antibiotics, creams, and nothing was working. And ultimately, um, I found a more enlightened doctor here in France. And um, oh, well, I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, she did some tests and she came back to me and said, well, your leg's not infected, but you are diabetic. And a quite brutal way to discover that that, that actually is, was the problem. Um, so she immediately prescribed me six months worth of metformin, which, which is the go-to drug for type two diabetes. Um, and um, I took it for a couple of days and I was already thinking, I don't want to go this route. Uh, I'll find a way of of overcoming this because I'd I'd read about uh, reversing diabetes because I keep I tend to keep my finger on the pulse of, of what's going on in natural medicine uh, and helping the body to restore itself. So I, I I searched around and found a lot of a lot of really useful information. There was a massive study had taken place at Newcastle University through Professor Roy Taylor. 
uh, using what is what really amounts to fasting, putting people on a very limited low carbohydrate diet um, under 600 calories a day and uh, avoiding carbohydrates wherever possible. And I took that and I adapted it. Um, I adapted it by using Michael Mosley's book, uh, The Eight Week Blood Sugar Diet, and came up with my own system that suits my body, my metabolism. And that ultimately came down to in intermittent fasting. So I would not eat anything before either midday or one o'clock. Um, at which point my pattern became that I had two scrambled eggs and a tomato almost every day because I just loved it and it made me feel good. And then whatever calories were left over uh, an evening meal with, with, uh, with my family. And I pursued that. And within four weeks, my blood sugar had normalized and I was out not only a pre-diabetic, but completely down from, from a um, blood sugar reading, which was 9.6 down to 5.6. And um, I've essentially, I've kept that up. I never eat anything before midday. Now, I'm Excellent. very sparing of what I do eat. I do, you know, living in France, I, I do have glasses of wine. I do allow myself I do extend uh, the calorific intake now I don't stick to five or six hundred but that long period of fasting from say seven o'clock in the evening uh, until um, midday or one o'clock the following day is a pattern that I've kept going and um, my blood sugars remained within the bounds you know it, it, it's absolutely fine um, at the time that's... I lost an awful lot of weight and really? that's where that's where I am I'm just I just feel that the pattern it one has to do what suits your own metabolism oh and the leg got exactly. better by the way so that was yeah. even better exactly exactly everybody's different aren't they absolutely Okay, so thank you for sharing that, Christine. So I'm just going to run through the different types of fasting that there is. Um, I'm sure most people will be familiar with intermittent fasting, but I'm just going to run through a few things. So if there's anybody on here who doesn't know about it and who's listening, they've got a bit more of an idea. So here again, I'm reading. So sorry if I'm not looking at you. So intermittent fasting involves cycling between periods of fasting and normal eating. And there are several different patterns, as Christine pertained to. The most common is 12-12 and 16-8. Now, what that means is people uh, eat, say, between 7 in the morning and 7 at night, and then they don't eat for the rest of the evening or until the next morning. Or you can do 16-8. And uh, that just means that you only eat for eight hours during the day. Um, and you're leaving your body to rest, your digestive system, for 16 hours. So they call that a time-restricted um, intermittent fasting. Then we have circadian rhythm, which is actually the uh, what they call eating between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. We have altern alternate day fasting, where you have one day where you're doing fasting and the next day you don't, and you just keep altering then there's the 5-2 diet where you eat normally for, for five days, your normal diet, and then for two days you fast in whichever way you choose. Could be intermittent fasting, could be water, you know. Then there's a five-day fast that people do. Um, and there's always a caution here. And, and Katie um, had pertained to the fact that she'd done um, some fasting, but she did it with fruit. And fruit is quite good because it's hydrating as well. So you know, that's um, a good thing. And Katie, you did say something about caffeine. Now, um, if you're on something like that, you would definitely have no caffeine. If you wanted to have a herbal tea, 
or um, a cup of tea even, you would have it black and you would have it decaffeinated because I'll go into that a little bit more later. So there's another one called eat, stop, eat, eat one day and then not again until the following evening. There's um, therapeutic fasting, which is what some of the things I do with my patients. I've been doing that for 25 years, but I'll explain more about that later. And then there's intermittent fasting, which is safe for most people, but it's still not for everyone. Um, some people need to steer clear of fasting altogether, and that's children, obviously. We don't want to put them on a fast um, unless there's some, you know, something medically that they're asked to do that. T um, and teenagers under 18, because they're still growing, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, well, that's, that's an obvious one. People with um, type 1 diabetes have to be careful. They can actually fast, but they need guidance real guidance, and especially, you know, because they're taking insulin. Um, people with kidney stones have to be careful. People with gourd, gastro, um, esophageal, geal <laughs> reflux. <laughs> um, thin and malnourished people, all those with chronic diseases. So there is, you do have to have a think about, you know, what else is going on in your body before you opt into some of these things. Um, here I come to the the little bit about caffeine because caffeine is a stimulant um, it increases the activity in your brain and your nervous system it's very good for people in the mornings they love it because they think they're waking up they also helps them to move their bowels sometimes because it increases the circulation um, it increases also in the circulation um, chemicals cortisol and adrenaline. So this is where it really messes with your nervous system when it's on an empty stomach. It also is known to stop your appetite, which is okay if it's just occasionally, but it's not something to do all the time. So best to have caffeine free, which is what I was talking about before. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the fasting that I do in my clinic. Um, it's not very long, and then we'll head into some other things, just being mindful of the time here. So Otto Buchinger. Now, some of you may have heard of him, some of you may not, but there are some of his clinics. He passed away in um, 1966. Um, he has a method that's still practised in the USA, Spain, and Germany. I don't think there's any others that, you know, don't take me, take that as gospel. There could be some in other places. So... Many sanitariums around the world where people go to, to do fasting um, use part of this practice. They may vary it a little bit, but it's basically the same practice. And, you know, that's been done since the early 20th century. I think um, two or three years ago, the clinic, Buchinger Clinics, um, celebrated 100 years. So it's been around for a while. It's also been around for a long while, as I said earlier, because it's been um, adopted into religions and that for, for a long, long time. Um, so when we're talking about the Buchinger way of fasting, and there's many different doctors in the past, um, I can read them all off, but I won't, but we'll just use him as an example. They avoid all solid food. They only have vegetable broth, teas, herbal teas, juices, and water. Um, and the fasting period can last five days or more. So this is their principles of, of what they do with their fasting. There's dry fasting, which you might have heard of, which I don't recommend. Um, it's something that you would do very rarely um, and it would be, have to be for a really specific issue. There's water fasting and some people do that really well. And I've, I know We've had um, patients on a water fast for up to 40 days, but that is a special case. Don't try to do that yourself. Then there's juice fasting, which is what, you know, the majority of, of, of people have probably heard of. Excuse my dog, if you can hear her. <laughs> um, so therapeutic fasting, as, as we practice it here in Australia, is typically juice fasting, and it's at least for nine or 10 days. So it's individualised, it's supported all the way through, 
with herbal teas, Chinese teas, tinctures, and enemas are extremely important because once you go longer than about three, three days, three to five days, if you don't clean out your bowel, even if you, you know, might have colonics, if anyone's heard of those, all of the debris sitting in the um, digestive system in the colon will start to be drawn back and circulated around the body. So you defeat the purpose of, of actually fasting. So something that people don't always realise, but that, that is what happens. Um, okay. We take it a step further with doing specific juices and specific tea mixtures that are tailored on a daily basis. They change from day to day depending on what organs we are working with. Um, that's to get the maximum amount of um, cleansing that we can. Balneotherapy, which are water therapies, they can be baths, um, enemas come under that too, but anything with water um, are also added to the procedures because if you are cleaning this end and you're cleaning the other end, the other biggest, the biggest organ is the skin. So you will get an even bigger cleanse if you do baths and um, you know, there's other water therapies that we could, that you can do. This is just to give you an idea what we do. But therapeutic fast, fasting is really a spiritual practice. And that's how um, it's not anything to do with, you know, connecting to uh, religions or anything like that. It's just a spiritual practice. We're cleaning the debris, obviously, from the body and creating new cellular structures. And we're enhancing the immune system. We said that earlier because that's what all fasting does on different levels. However, at the same time, we're also working with the mind and we're relieving, alleviating all the debris of unwanted thoughts, feelings, um, emotions, traumas and values that we may have taken on from others since we entered into the world. And we all know that we've done that because our family gives us certain values and you know, teachers and whoever we come in contact with. So we make up our own value system, but we often take on other ones that we think we have to do. We have to have these values, except that's not sitting right inside. So this, these are the things that can come up during fasting. So this is why I'm saying everybody needs a support person to call to get them through those times when something might come up because, you know, some people will stop fasting because they can't deal with what's coming up. So that just means that you need to go through it, get to the other side, and then and I know we say letting it go, but we can't let everything go 100% because it just stays in the back here because that's a part of who we are. We can't cut out things and eradicate them completely. We, we still have them, but they are smaller particles in our cells. Weight loss is a side effect which differs from person to person, but that is just a side effect. Okay, so we're working on the mind and the body and the weight loss is a side effect. This is what we do in the clinic because we're working with very ill people. Okay, so um, some people, um, yeah, I, I won't go into it now. You don't need to know all that. So it's all about preservation of our body and mind, longevity and peace within. So that's that's where fasting comes from on the spiritual sides of things. If anyone hasn't fasted before, they should consider starting a one-day fast um, just to make sure there's no adverse effects and that they're familiar with what they need to do. Um, and, you know, just get your support and... Uh, we often say in the clinic that if you might need to do three um, lots of fasting and then you're sort of okay to get off and do it on your own. So I can go into that if anybody wants to know about that later. Um, I've already said people stop fasting because they don't feel capable because the fear comes up as well of different things, traumas and things like that that have happened. So that's really something to watch. Um and really, you just want to move past it so you get, get a higher perspective of what's actually happened um, in those times in the past and, you know, you can see them from a different viewpoint. Um, 
So this is why we take time to prepare for fasting. You know, when we're doing long fasts, anything up to nine, 10 days or, you know, even up to 40, you do need to prepare. You've got to prepare your mind and your body and really know what it is that you've got to do so that you don't stop the process if you want to get the end result that you're after. So everything is different for everybody. I've already said that, but let's get on because I've nattered enough. So let's have a think about, um, you know, when you first started to explore fasting, the comments that you may have got, the myths and misconceptions that people um, have, they may have read about or someone said something to them and then they go saying things to you. Um, so I'm going to go around the panel and just ask, you know, um, starting with Patricia, are there any myths or misconceptions that, you know, you've come across? I, I think um, um, I've tried to keep my intermittent fasting as simple as possible. Um, and um, something that something that comes up a lot is, oh, I need to keep topping up my blood sugars. Um, or I get faint. Well, actually, a friend who know me will tell you that all my life I had fainting fits and I used to blame it on low sugar. The reason why I, it was low sugar was because I was eating sugar in between. So when you don't have sugar and you keep, and you don't keep topping up, your sugar levels all the time, um, it, it actually balances out your sugar levels. Um, people worry um, that um, if, they're, if they're diabetic, I really need to keep my sugar. But as you said, uh, Sandy, it's type one diabetes you need to worry about more than type two. Um, also, um, you do need to watch your, if you're on metformin, you do need to watch what levels of metformin you're taking because otherwise um, you could push your sugar levels too low because the metformin is working as well as the fast. So you need to be watching what medication you're on. And I think that's the biggest myth. The other myth is that, oh, it's um, binging and starving, but actually it's not. Because what happens and what ha certainly happened for me was that it balanced out my appetite control. And um, I find now that I eat a lot less than I did. At one time, I used to binge and starve, but that's not what fasting is. Fasting is about giving your body a rest in between. For me, there has still been sometimes, just from time to time, there's that little devil that comes in and says, um, you've just eaten too much, you're binging and starving. But actually, it's a, for, for a lot of people um, with intermittent fasting, it's losing what we call the diet brain. And um, if you've been like me, 60 years of dieting and 60 years of binging and starving, the, you, the old diet brain comes in and says, you shouldn't be eating that, um, that's fattening and so on. But I was only listening to a podcast this morning by Jen Stevens again, and she was saying that a lot of people are under the impression that when you're, when you're eating, eat as much as you can to top yourself up for fasting, but it doesn't work that way. Um, so yes, you can easily fall into the binging and fasting um, thing if you're not careful but I find that it's actually control it's it's given me appetite control and I eat a lot less now naturally without counting calories than I did before in all those years of yo-yo dieting excellent that's great news okay Katie what myths and misconceptions have you come across um, well, I suppose I've always tended to be this sort of stature. And so obviously people go, oh, my goodness, you're too slim to fast. You're waste away, you know, <laughs> because I haven't got any spare on me anyway. Um, but actually, I found and the only time I found I was really losing weight was when I did a month of raw food. But I never felt hungry because I was eating so much um, 
basically fruit and veg in various forms, plus organic brown rice. Um, I think I added in part way. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, but it was amazing. I, I just didn't feel there was, there was so much fiber there that I never felt hungry once. That's another thing which I was a bit fearful about if I'm honest, because I do have quite a large appetite. So certainly if you're doing, I tend to do smoothie type fasting rather than juices and then I've got the fiber. Um, otherwise I feel I have to sort of take psyllium husks and you know, these, fiber that just passes through so as you were saying you get stuff out of the body and it's not slushing around um so certainly yeah I didn't feel that I wasted away at all um and the other thing that was has been very interesting for me is that um I've fallen in the last year or so into mainly doing intermittent fasting so having it does vary i'm not very strict about the times but it's at least 12 hours and up to 16 and i find that uh, a bit like you really i love having i make myself a big plate of salad for around midday and have a couple of eggs is scrambled or in an omelet and i just love that it seems like such a great way to to break the fast if you like um, and this has been a revelation because I was such a big fan once I'd stabilized my blood sugar with re removing a lot of sugar was that you need carbs and things in the morning. And I, for 25 years, I made my own muesli and porridge, put loads of seeds, dried fruit, uh, fresh fruit, and really enjoyed it. And then I thought, actually, it makes absolutely zero difference. I was really reluctant. I was hanging on to it because I loved it so much. Mm -hmm. But I let it go. And actually, it's just as good having other things. So really, I think it's about experimenting. And exactly as um, you were saying earlier, find something that works for you, as Christine mentioned, because you could really be surprised um, by what works for you. Yeah. Excellent. That's good. Okay. Christine, what myths and misconceptions have you come across? Well, I I, I think I've I've encountered what most people who who diet and who fast encounter, which is um that can't be good for you. Um breakfast is the king. Uh yeah, you how how can you you know your body needs a lot of carbohydrate? How can you possibly manage without um carbohydrate? And learning to counter those comments um with with experience and with results is is uh is very important, I feel. Uh, yeah, I there are as, as we we would all know because we are experienced at fasting that the first if if you're doing um if you're changing your diet i think in any way and quite radically uh and going for reduced calories or no calories um there there are side effects you do i think most the, from what i've heard and my own experience um headaches and just generally feeling quite weak and wizzy and needing time for the you're asking your body and your mind and your spirit to go through big changes and you have to be patient with with the process and I suppose I, I always make sure that I'm drinking vast amounts of water anyway because for one thing, it, it helps with if there are in the beginning stages, if there are pangs of hunger, then drinking. You know, I, I, I think I think there's all, we often feel that we're hungry when we're thirsty. Um, don't we forget to we forget to drink enough? And uh, so I, dr I drink I do still drink masses of water. I usually would have a one and a half litre bottle of water sitting beside me. Um, you know, I I've also been through the 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 um the pattern of dieting, yo-yo dieting for 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 many years, 
um, but particularly after the birth of, of my second child, where my, my metabolism seemed to shift. And it would, so there would be a lot of helpful, supposedly helpful advice about what to do. Um, but it usually involved a lot of a lot of carbohydrate and it's really since I gave up on carbohydrate that that I found a vast difference not only in in my body itself but in my energy levels and the way the way I generally feel um I was working in another capacity with a, a neurologist who had a, a patient a teenager and who, who was was suffering from anxiety and depression and she she did this experiment she found out what this young woman's diet was uh and it largely con it consisted of a lot of junk food basically and a lot of mcdonald's and that type of of um of food and she said i'll tell you what we'll swap diets for two weeks i eat what you eat and you eat the recommended diet that I'm going to give you and um, she said by the end of the two weeks she was experiencing quite a lot of the symptoms that her patient was experiencing uh, and the and the young woman was actually getting better so I, I, I think there's just a lot of misinformation out there and also um, because of the the way the food industry works, you know, the industrial complex food industry that loads our food with sugar. You know, we went into this low fat thing. We, you know, we'll have fat free and low fat. But in order to keep the flavor, the foods were all loaded with sugar. And that is one of the big challenges of this um, diabetes and obesity epidemic is, is hidden sugar. It's the hidden sugars and that type of thing that that we live with. Um, so that I I think I probably over the over the course of my life experienced most of the comments you know that that we all have about what what one ought to do, what you should do, what the doctors recommend, but. I think one needs to look for an enlightened medical information um, rather than following what's what the government or the food processing industry tells you you ought to be having. And one of the things that I I, I feel is vitally important if you are operating on a reduced calorie and a reduced scope of food is to make sure that you take appropriate su um, supplements you know I, I tackled my diabetes by adding um, cinnamon chromium picolinate um, turmeric and various other uh, super gymnema various supplements that are known to help with the sugar um, aspects of, of of, of uh, stabilizing your blood sugar yeah it's great isn't it what we can do it's just yeah. it's not, not the run of the mill but hopefully it'll get more prevalent and people will write and people will read more about how to, what to do i'm just going to go through thanks christine i'm just going to go through um i've got a couple of other things here so um i've got oh, this is just a list of myths that i found so intermittent fasting essentially means skipping breakfast. These are the things people are misinformed about. Um, it's the miracle cure for all weight loss. Uh, and all intermittent fasting is the same, so they haven't sort of delved into it. It's just what they've heard. And it's good for everyone. You should eat anything you, anything you want during the eating window. So you can eat whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> and you know going to get the same result but perhaps not um it repairs um your mental alertness and focus um sorry it can impair your mental alertness and focus which is a misnomer because it actually helps 
Um, it slows down your metabolism. It makes you overindulge. We've just talked about that and we've got a question about that. So I'll have a chat about that in a sec. Um, you're supposed to restrict your water intake during the fasting window. Well, when you're actually fasting, you're usually asleep. So, <laughs> um, you know, that's not, uh, not too hard to do anyway. Um, and it puts your body into starvation mode. They're basically things that we've already mentioned. Um, but uh, we do have a question that I have here, and it's from Lorna. So thanks for being here, Lorna, and listening. Um, are there any tips for the regulation of appetite when using intermittent fasting? Now, one of the things um, Christine actually mentioned is sometimes we think we're hungry, but we're actually thirsty. So one of the tricks is that you can always go and have a glass of water if you're feeling, if you believe you're feeling hungry and give it five minutes or so and then see if you're still hungry. It could be just that you're thirsty. Uh, some of the other things, um, if you do intermittent fasting, and I'm sure Patricia will um, agree with me here is that once you get into it and you're doing it regularly and consistently you everything changes and balances out so that you don't have these um uh, appetite binges which is what you were talking about before so um you know I think that probably covers it but when we go around again in a moment we can maybe add something else if we think of it that can help Lorna now just bear with me while I turn the page. Which, excuse me, I'm not supposed to lick my finger now since that that time when we we're not supposed to do that. Um, the last few years. So let's go around again, and um, you know we've probably touched, and Christine's touched on a few things already for her. Um, but what benefits did you? Extra benefits that you may not have already mentioned that helped you during fasting. Before we do that, I'm just going to say about what I've been doing. I've just done a 21 day juice fast um, and feel fabulous, obviously. And I do this every year and I do um, monthly ones and daily ones, uh, weekly ones, etc. But that's, I'm walking the talk because I'm doing it with patients as well, but it helps me. I'm, I'm never taken any medications and uh, don't take too many um, supplements either um, and it just keeps my body in check. Um, but, yeah, the benefits to me are that I've, I get clarity and I'm going to share something that I, I used to do. When I was studying naturopathy, um, nutrition and other things, before my exams I would deliberately fast to get a clear head I had teenagers on my own and I was working three jobs and I was studying, <laughs> so I needed to get clarity. And that was one of the uses that I used my fasting for was to get my head clear. Um, obviously has other benefits too. The skin, my skin gets, you know, into a, a beautiful, lovely, silky state, um, getting rid of any bumps and et cetera. It always feels good. So. That's just from my perspective. But over to you, Patricia, what sort of things do you find um, that, you know, other things that have helped your body with doing intermittent fasting? Um, definitely more clarity and, um, and, and also uh, 18 months ago, well, two years ago, um, I was in quite a lot of pain and that's almost disappeared. Yeah. Um, I do get the occasional flare-up, um, but it's certainly not, on, you know, it, the pain has gone from um, all the places that I used to have. Uh, I, I, the only pain I get now is repetitive injury kind of things, you know, a sore wrist from too much knitting and crocheting and things like that, but uh, definitely less pain than I was in because of the fact that the inflammation has gone down. Um, I, um, yes, more clarity. I enjoy the feeling of lightness 
that my body experiences. I haven't actually lost weight from being an intermittent faster, which is the reason why I went into it in the first place. But because there's so many other benefits, um, I, I'm not interested in losing weight. And um, I also found that I don't really need to anyway. And my body is happy as it is. So, yeah, I mean, the, uh, and, and also I've always been hooked on weighing myself. I don't weigh myself now, maybe occasionally just see how it's going. Um, so I used to be a slave to the scales, but I'm not anymore. It doesn't matter. Um, I go by my clothes. If my clothes are getting too tight, I maybe will cut down a little bit when I am eating. Um, but other than that, I, I just feel free of all those dieting years when I was obeying rules. And I haven't got any more rules in my life now. I do what my body loves. Excellent. That's wonderful news. Katie, what about you? Well, it's interesting. That struck a chord with me to some extent. And it's partly really the mentally letting go of food, this idea of food, and you know, especially things like breakfast, which was always a good thing. I loved my <laughs> porridge and muesli breakfast. So thinking, is it meant fasting? I'm not going to be able to eat that sort of thing. It was, you know, it felt like a, a huge step to do that. But I thought, well, you know, just give this a go. And I think that letting go of food for a while has been good in other respects. It's been helping me to let go of other things as well. And it, ironically, there's almost, there's more control. I feel that there's more control because I'm not getting cravings that I used to. I mean, I've had pretty good nutritional uh, approach really for the last 20 odd years, but I still notice that things like the dark chocolate content creeps up and it goes up and up. And then I think, whoa, time for a, I need to do a bit of cleansing here and then I find it completely goes away and the longest one I did which was the raw um, sort of smoothies really that at the end of it I couldn't believe that at the end of it if you'd said to me here's a 200 gram bar of your favorite chocolate and here's a large head of celery which would you prefer and I every I would have gone the celery I couldn't believe it because I'd felt like such a slave to chocolate and cheese for so many years. So that was, um, yeah, that was, that was great. So anytime I know just do a fast and then it cuts out all those sort of longings that you might be getting about it. And I think it is really important setting, you mentioned Sandy, the preparation. And really for me, it's mainly mental. I'm just going, I'm going to do this and it's not going to be an issue. It's only three days or it's only four days, whatever. So, um, yeah, really worth it. And I, I just, it, it amuses me what comes up each time. Uh. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and um, you know, for, for people that are doing the really deep fasting, they get some quite interesting things come up, especially if they've got psychological problems, um, you know, that comes up for them. But if we work through it, and get out the other side every you know there's so much more peaceful inside and then that reflects up here too so yeah, yeah interesting definitely. isn't it yeah christine what else has it done for you apart from your diabetes um well certainly vastly improved energy levels um and um and, and that includes like mental energy as well, um, you know, clarity, um, and, uh, and 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 a sort of a sense of of reconnection. I, I think um, I think it takes. Yeah, you know, I've I've always loved food and cooking, and spent a lot of time planning meals and wanting wanting to. Um, you know, give give good dinner parties and all the rest of it, and um, it, it's it's like a, a freedom that I'll cook when I want to, rather than 
because I I feel obligated to entertain people. So that's been that's been a very interesting process um, for me, and that, that I think also I can using two contrasting situations when I'm when I'm very um, very clear in what I'm eating and very much on the very very low carb um, spectrum then I, I, I do have a, a great deal of um, I, I get more ideas and more creative there's I, I'm it's like a, a source almost a source of inspiration in itself because there's and and I'm going to relate this to to something I, I think there's a in our society, there's a sense that it's not okay to be hungry, that, it, that hunger is to be avoided at all costs. Mm, yeah. But actually, and, and you know, there are, there are countless reasons why that occurs from, from being babies going through the terrible twos and being awkward toddlers. And, you know, and we probably have this with our own children and grandchildren as well but in fact that sense I don't in terms of um, I think it was Lorna asking a question about hunger if you learn to embrace hunger it actually becomes exhilarating mm. and it's you learn that there is absolutely no fear in being hunger and that in hungry being hungry and that that sense of emptiness inside actually helps you have a, a spiritual surge and also it like clears the brain as well so you for me that the, the the sense of how great it feels to be empty i i love it when my stomach feels like it's, it's empty it feels the, the sense of it, it feels flatter and it feels as if there's huge capacity so rather than hunger being something to be afraid of, embrace it and just, you know, you don't have to do it for very long. It's not as if I don't think any of us are in a situation of deprivation where, where, where we're in famine, but the body very quickly can decide it's in a famine and it wants a feast. But if you resist the urge to feast and embrace the famine in the short term, you, you find that there are huge benefits in the way both your body and your spirit and your mind feel. Absolutely. That's been for me a profound insight. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's excellent, Christine. It's, um, you know, this is what um, Lorna actually asked. Um, is it a mental hunger or a physical hunger? So I think you've probably, <laughs> probably just answered that question for her. Um, and uh, and Ruth Fox, hi Ruth, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, she's getting lots of benefits from um, from intermittent fasting, so that's great too. Fabulous. Um, we've got five minutes left, so let's wrap this up. So I just want to mention. Um, I said that I'd just done a twenty-one day um, fast, juice fast. Um, and just for you to know, I won't be back on, um, if you want to call it a normal diet, I probably don't eat what everyone else does anyway, um, is 21 days. So I do the same as breaking the fast and go very slowly back on to foods. So broths to, to um, juices to soups, etc. So very slow getting back onto, onto foods because you've basically cleaned your body out like a baby's and you don't want to treat it as if you go and have a nice ice cream or spun some jam and cream or something like that. So just wanted to mention that too because that's important. And we did mention the bit about preparing your mind, which Katie brought up to when you're going to do anything. This doesn't have to be about fasting. You, you prepare. You prepare in your mind what it is that you're going to do. So really important. Um, people often ask me what is the best time to fast now intermittent fasting is a continuation because if you've built it into you into your um life you're either um doing it continually or doing it 
twice a week or the second day or whatever it is that you decide to do. So that's a continuum. And it's not um, the type of fasting where you have to be very careful, say, during the winter that, you know, you will get too cold because you're still having enough enough to eat most of the time. So really um, the the only times when you're doing longer fasting to be mindful is it's best in spring or early summer and because your body isn't adap adapting much easier in these temperatures. And um, it is in case um, our weather is changing, so just keep the temperatures in mind. So spring, early summer, autumn is good, early autumn, but not winter. I've already said that, too cold, and not summer if it's really, really hot. So we're talking about prolonged fasting here. Um, too many um, intermittent fasters, um, you know, it's, it's what I'm going to say is it's a really great stepping stone to get your whole body more balanced you know it but it takes time and I'm sure Patricia will agree it doesn't happen overnight you've got to you know keep at it sometimes we get all these negative comments from people because they've tried it for a day and it hasn't <laughs> it hasn't worked for yeah. them so you know that it but they probably do that with a lot of things those sorts of people but you really have to build it into your into your daily regime, weekly regime. So, but it's really good because it helps your digestive and mental health because we know that our digestion upset, our thoughts are upset. If our thoughts are upset, our you know emotions or anything else, then our digestion often gets upset. So it's really about keeping that balance and that calm persona going. And I I really hope that over the years as they go by that more people realize that less is more eating less and better quality food but they've got to understand what good quality food is too is much better for their overall health that's where I've always been coming from for the last 30 40 years with my work so for me therapeutic fasting is my ultimate goal for myself and my patients but remembering I'm working with some interesting um cases um, and I'm currently writing a, a book on therapeutic fasting with the, the doctor from Russia who I've worked with for over 25 years. He used to, he was one of the forebears in, um, and took over from some of the, the doctors over there that were doing fasting. He's a scientist and a biochemist, so we have a lot of studies and a lot of, um, uh, yeah, science-backed information and that that, that we, we use in our in our own work so I've learned so much from him in the last 25 years I'm hoping the book helps lots of people so that's from me but before we round up and it is nine o'clock I just wanted to ask any of the panel if there's anything else that they wanted to add uh, yes I, um, I'd like to add that one of the most important things you can do is when during your eating window is to eat as many nourishing foods as possible. Um, avoid ultra processed foods. Don't worry too much about carbohydrate if you're eating whole um, carbohydrate. I think that just about sums it up. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. warm foods are much better, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Body accepts them much better and you'll have more energy because we're all about yeah. conserving as much energy as we can. Especially as we get, get the wrong method <laughs> that fasting means low carbohydrate. It's not necessarily that. We all have to find out what suits us. Exactly, exactly. Because whole grains, I have quite a lot of whole grains, but I don't touch yeah. the, you know, all the refined, refined carbohydrates yes. aren't on our, my radar. But you know, they're the things that we really need to avoid. Okay, so. Um, yeah, on could I say phone? something? Yes, of course. Say something quickly. It was just that um, if I found that if you are feeling hungry, that having hot water or warm water can actually mm. be a bit more satisfying than having it cold. So I found that really works. Um, if you have cravings, apple cider vinegar is great because it's sour. 
you can have it very dilute, but that can really help as well um, in terms of trying to get off, you know, because sugars obviously can be a bit of a difficulty. And my last point is just that um, I and a friend like to do when we do fasting for uh, say three days or more, that we would tend to do it between the a full moon and the new moon because then the energy is about throwing off things because yes. the time after the uh, sorry yes I think that's right uh, it's between the full moon and the new moon because that's it sort of suits our energy and I don't know whether it affects women more but it's a, it's a thought that's occurred to me that perhaps it, it helps because our cycles tend to be a bit more in tune with the moon um so that's something that I try and do as well. Excellent, because that has a big bearing on um, when you do fasting as well individually. So, yeah, well, that's a good one. Okay, well, we'd better leave it there. We're just after nine o'clock, unless there's any other burning things anyone wants to say. We'd better wrap up. And I want to thank the panel for being here. And uh, I hope everybody who's listening gets some information that um, they haven't heard before or that, you know, some confirmation that, um, you know, where they're maybe thinking about heading is absolutely fine and going to help them enormously. So thanks again and uh, we'll leave it there and, and see you next time. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.